It's been one full year with the Chase Sapphire Preferred. Since I've gotten this card, it's been a core part in my wallet setup. I've spent consistently on it, earning almost 100,000 ultimate rewards points, made big redemptions, and feel strongly enough to know exactly where this card has truly exceeded my expectations and also where it's fallen short. So in this video, I wanna give you that honest truth. If you're someone who hasn't had this card, it's gonna be an awesome video to show you behind the scenes as to what having this card is actually like. And if you have the Chase Sapphire Preferred like myself, you can compare notes about my experiences versus your own and see how they stack up. This is gonna be a fun one, so let's go. Let me give you a little bit of background. A year ago, when I first got approved of this card, I was moving from Team Cash back on to Team Travel, and I was looking for cards that could give me massive sign-up bonuses for a relatively low annual fee because I wasn't quite ready to take the enormous jump into some of the biggest premium travel cards that also carry those premium level annual fees. That made the Chase Sapphire Preferred the perfect card to get the ball rolling with. In my first year using this card weekly, there are five things I really wanna share with you that I absolutely loved and blew my expectations out of the water. On the other side though, there are three things I have today for you that I absolutely did not like at all and are seriously making me consider whether this is a viable long-term card to keep around. Let's start with the very first thing that I loved, which is the value of the sign-up bonus that I got upon approval. The sign-up bonus that I got was the standard Chase Sapphire Preferred sign-up bonus. If you know this card, you know that's a flat 60,000 ultimate rewards points that Chase says are valued at $750. For me to achieve that, I needed to hit $4,000 of spend in the first three months, which I was able to do by shifting all of my spending strategically onto this card to get that done. Now I will say from tracking this card from a long time, Chase occasionally puts higher sign-up bonuses out there. The maximum offer that's ever been out there was 100,000 points, and that was in 2021. And recently, we did see an offer for 80,000 points, but Chase puts those out there very few and far between. If you're thinking about getting this card, know that 60,000 is the standard, and if you happen to see a higher offer when you apply for the card, definitely jump on that one because they do not stick around for a very long time. You can use my links down below in the description if you decide to actually apply for this card yourself. And if you do, that is the best free way other than just watching the videos to support the channel. However, I'm not as interested about telling you how much the bonus was that I got, rather so the actual value that comes with that bonus. In my opinion, Chase Ultimate Rewards Points may be some of the most valuable currency that you can get in the credit card game. You also have flexibility and options. Inside the Chase Travel Portal, you'll get a standard value of a 1.25 cent point multiplier on every single point you have. And a practical example of what that looks like in real life is typically a $288 flight would cost you 28,000 800 points in any other travel portal outside of Chase's. However, when you have the Chase Sapphire Preferred and that 1.25x multiplier, that same flight is gonna cost you 23,037 points when booked through Chase. That's a practical example that with the Sapphire Preferred, every point that you earn just means more. However, something I quickly recognize that some of my favorite transfer partners like Southwest United and Hyatt, which are all phenomenal options for domestic redemptions in the United States, give you even better value potential. I knew that in the worst case scenario, if something terrible came up financially, I could take my sign-up bonus and all the points I'd been earning and cash those out at a flat one cent per point value. That flexibility and those three different options of redemptions give you tons of peace of mind as a card owner that you're gonna be able to use these points how you need. And truly the value these points hold was one of my favorite things about always having this card. However, this leads me directly into my second favorite thing about the Sapphire Preferred, and that's what I personally turn those points into, my Chase Sapphire Preferred Redemption. As I first shared, when I got this card, I knew I wanted a great travel card that would earn me a ton of points at a reasonable sign-up bonus. At the time I got it, I didn't have my exact redemption yet planned out. However, when I did find the place that I wanted to use those points, it ended up being my most valuable travel redemption ever. I took 84,000 Chase Ultimate Rewards points, 
Most of them, the first 60,000, were earned from the sign-up bonus, and the rest, they came through responsible, normal spending, especially in those Sapphire preferred elevated categories, specifically like dining. Once I earned 84,000 points through Chase, I transferred them over to my World of High Rewards account. Inside of World of High, you can get incredible value for points, and that's one of the reasons that people love Chase, that same transfer relationship. I was able to redeem those 84,000 points, for a stay that would have cost over $2,000 if booked in cash. My total redemption value was at 2.3 cents per point. I've made a full video detailing that redemption, how nice it was, and also the three steps that I went about to actually book that beginning to end. If you subscribe to the channel, I'll encourage you to check that video out later after you're done watching this one. Because that video exists, I'm not gonna spend much time in this one talking about the different details of the resort. However, just the fact that I was able to turn 84,000 chase points, which only really cost me my normal spending, plus a fee of $95 to hold the chase sapphire preferred, into a resort that was all paid for, all inclusive with drinks, food, and every amenity that you'd ever want that was located in paradise, all for a value of $2,000 plus in cash. And I did that all with one credit card, that instantly put Chase Redemptions as one of my absolute favorite things and benefits about holding this card. My third favorite aspect of the Sapphire Preferred is the $50 hotel credit. Now this is something that for whatever reason, I don't personally feel like the card gets enough credit for that it has that value there. People look at the Chase Sapphire Preferred like a $95 card, but truly, if you stay at one hotel the entire year, it becomes a $45 card once that credit is applied. I used this benefit almost immediately when getting the card because I got the card right before I had to book a number of different work trips and I used part of that spend to help me meet my signup bonus. I put the $50 credit into action right away on my first work trip booking down to St. Petersburg, Florida, where I chose to stay at the Hollander Boutique Hotel, which I did find in the Chase Travel Portal, and it was a really cool, unique hotel that I probably wouldn't have discovered otherwise. The best part of it, since booking through Chase Travel, Chase automatically applied that $50 credit that I get as a benefit for holding the Sapphire Preferred. Not only that, since I know some of you can book work trips as well and get them reimbursed by your company, I did the same thing. I booked the trip with cash using my Sapphire Preferred. That means I got the 5X points for booking through the portal. I then went and got that purchase reimbursed by my company. And then a few days later, Chase credits me with the $50 travel credit. So, in a way, I actually made out with $50 on that deal. My fourth favorite realization from holding this card was just how strong the Chase ecosystem really is. When I got the Sapphire Preferred, that was my first Chase card. However, after about eight months of having the Sapphire Preferred, I decided to add the Freedom Flex right alongside to increase the earnings rate and really optimize my regular spending inside my wallet. The Freedom Flex, which is a nice $0 annual fee card, complements the Chase Sapphire Preferred perfectly. See, there are so many different issuers out there who market cashback cards that are kept completely separate away from their cards that earn points or miles that can be redeemed for travel. These two cards actually pair together perfectly because the spending that I earn on the Freedom Flex, that can be transferred right over to the Sapphire Preferred and redeemed at the higher multipliers or transferred out to get even more value. It's simple pulling your points together and just takes a few clicks within Chase, and then you've effectively maximized your normal everyday spend. Finally, point number five I wanna share is actually the eventual downgrade options to get rid of the Chase Sapphire Preferred one day. This is gonna sound really strange. I just spent the first half of this video talking up how much I like the Sapphire Preferred and listing all the different great benefits that I personally have experienced in the first year. However, as I transition to the points that I don't like after finishing this last one that I do, you may realize that the Chase Sapphire Preferred is not going to be a forever card in your own wallet, and I don't think it will be in mine personally either. One of the best parts about Chase though is you can take a Sapphire Preferred and downgrade it to a $0 annual fee freedom card, and you don't have to get the credit score ding that comes along with canceling the card. There are other issuers like Capital One who may not offer you any downgrade options for a card like the Venture X, or in the American Express travel family, the lowest you can get is downgrading to the green card, which is still a $150 charge card that you're stuck with that annual fee on. Now, having that flexibility is a massive benefit, and I think this is a perfect time to tell you about the three things on this card that I truly 
didn't like. The first thing that I'm gonna share that I really didn't like about having this card is what I'm gonna call earnings category weaknesses. For me, one of the biggest problems after I got my signup bonus was it's actually a little bit more difficult than you'd think to consistently earn points just using the Sapphire Preferred. Don't get me wrong, the Sapphire Preferred has some really great categories. It earns you 5X on travel when booked through Chase, 3X on dining, 3X on online groceries, 3X on streaming services, 2X on travel even booked outside of Chase, and 1X on everything else. However, when it got down to it, really the only two categories that I used consistently was the 3X and using this as my dining card, and also the 3X I'd get on streaming services, which for me, isn't that much spend overall every single month. Those are still valuable categories. However, if you're looking to earn consistent points through regular spend, the card is actually missing a ton. There's no gas category, there's only a 1x multiplier on the everything else category, and for most people, I think that catch-all category is actually by far their biggest regular spend category. Online groceries do seem like they'd have potential, but for me, I shop at Walmart, and anyways, if I were to go to a different grocery store, a lot of them don't have the best online portals yet to order your groceries. So it really doesn't actually play out in reality like it would seem on paper. Problem number one leads me right into problem number two. If you have the Chase Half Hour Preferred, you're probably sooner or later going to want to get the Chase Trifecta. This is because of problem number one, you really can't build an efficient long-term setup just by holding the Sapphire Preferred by itself. This leads you even further into Chase's card system, having to get the Freedom Unlimited for the 1.5x cash back on everything else category, and the Freedom Flex for those bonuses getting 5x back on those rotating categories. Now, this isn't a massive issue, especially if you end up really liking Chase. However, the fact that you have to carry around three different cards and know and keep track of when to spend which for a lot of people, that is just a little bit too much card management, and even for me, with a bunch of different cards in my wallet, can get a little bit tiring at times. Of course, every single person is going to have their own perspective on how much they're willing to deal with. For me, it's not enough to make me wanna get out of Chase, I really still love the bank, but I'm not afraid to say that it is an annoyance and a definite drawback for getting into the Sapphire Preferred. Finally, my third biggest issue with the Sapphire Preferred is that this card has actually become stagnant. Let me explain what I mean. We've seen other credit cards recently. You've probably seen a ton of different videos made on them out there that are getting refreshments. They're getting new categories, they're getting new credits, and those issuers are changing the game. We've also seen a number of new, really competitive cards enter the market too that are very similar to the Sapphire Preferred. And honestly, some of them, for some people out there, are probably better. Looking back at the Sapphire Preferred history, we really haven't seen this card get much attention from Chase in terms of major updates or refreshments for a number of years, and I'm worried that's going to continue. For example, the City Strata Premier came into existence in mid-2024, and it offers some better aspects addressing two of the concerns that I had just before these in the way that that card is built out. That card also offers 3X on restaurants, but it additionally offers 3X on groceries in person in the store, which is much easier to use, and has a 3X category on gas, which is another top spending category for most people out there. That's a much more sustainable card, and it comes with the same $95 annual fee. So if two people are comparing them side by side, some people are going to go with the Strata Premier and say, I don't wanna worry about the negatives with the Chase Sapphire Preferred and just go for that instead in a simpler setup. I'm not personally ready to make that switch. However, I wouldn't blame people who say they are. I hope you like this honest breakdown of the Sapphire Preferred. Keep an eye on the channel because I will absolutely update you with what I decide to do with this card in the future. I will be keeping it another year, but there could be some fun surprises in the way I get out of this card and what comes next in my Chase setup. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.